I'm, I'm very happy to introduce uh, John uh, Priach, and I've, have I pronounced that correctly? No, I've made a total mess of that. Director of MAKE. <laughs> John joined MAKE at the beginning of 2004. Um, he's led on several key uh, regeneration projects, including the Elephant Castle Master Plan. Um, he just uh, has returned from Sydney, he tells me, uh, where Make's first project there is currently on site. It's a 74,000 square metre uh, development of the city that includes um, a station, uh, residential um, buildings and a commercial tower and uh, retail. Um, the practice has offices in London, Hong Kong and Sydney. And over to you. Uh, make abroad, so it's as if we're on tour or something. Um, so yeah, as, as we were saying, we obviously the, the mothership's in London, and we have Hong Kong and Sydney at the moment. But um, it all started initially in, in Beijing, and one of my, my colleagues and friends, former colleagues and friends, John Putex in the office, who started our Beijing office. And um, you know, sometimes the question, why do you start offices in Beijing or anywhere? Well, actually, his wife was going to work in Beijing, so we thought it would be a good idea because we really liked John. He was a top bloke, and uh, he did us a fantastic service of working in Beijing. Anyway, long and short of it is, <clears throat> for reasons uh, to do with environment and other things as well, we moved the whole show to Hong Kong. Um, but Sydney was a different story. We, we actually went to Sydney through having won a competition with Brookfield, and um, they basically said, come here or you don't have the project, so we, we moved to Sydney. Um, we now have 25 people there. So our project locations, we um, will we'll go anywhere, but within reason. Uh, the Middle East is a little bit bare on our part, but the Far East has been quite successful for us. Uh, in Europe, um, Germany, Switzerland, Hungary and Slovakia, for those that don't know those countries. Um, and here are a sample of some of those, those projects. About 20% of what we do now is abroad. And you might ask, why 20? Well, is that 20 because we've tried harder, or is it 20 because the market in the UK is slower? Um, might be the latter. So some general points. So this is a statistic that you probably have seen before, the GLA economics statistic, which really says a lot about how great British architectural profession is perceived abroad. Um, and what a great job we are exporting uh, our intellectual capital. Um, so why, why take the risk? Well, at the moment, I think there's better reasons why. Um, very much the diversification element in any business makes enormous sense. Um, but a few basic considerations. So make sure that you have something unique to offer. Don't go into another market thinking you can do what they do, you just, just won't win. Um, Make sure you understand the investment costs. It's not a cheap gig. It really isn't. And no matter how you try to save money on it, it's going to cost you. Um, focus your market ambitions. Don't try and do 20 countries when actually you should just be doing two. Um, understand local taxes. Quite often, if you try to bring your money back, you, attract, you can be taxed twice, twice, both internally and externally. So make, a, make either agreements with those, country, those clients or don't go there. Um, and then the question is, do you partner with local people or do you set up your own business? I mean, that will depend on circumstances, of course. Um, <clears throat> I think being British is a major advantage, um, not just uh, because of our language, because of the connections. In the Commonwealth particularly, I found uh, an incredibly great source uh, of, of great business. We, I actually went on a, on a trip with the UKTI to Malaysia and uh, the presentations, and most of the presentations that were given by, by local architects and planners and developers um, were, were those that actually had gone to UK universities. And so you can imagine a lot of these people are, are, are already quite positive about the UK because they'd had a great time when they were students in the UK and have this kind of sort of romanticised view of Britishness being absolutely fantastic. or well, British pubs, perhaps, is the memory. Um, another one is the, the expanding markets. Now, this is, I mean, the bricks are not what the bricks used to be. Um, but we did take, um, I did take a trip to Brazil with a colleague post-2012 to see what the 2016 was going to be for us. 
and uh, it became immediately apparent that it just wasn't. Um, the market was quite loaded towards the contractor. Um, the money perhaps wasn't as transparently transferable as might be considered. I'll leave you to believe what that means. And the politics wasn't good enough, really. So, so we declined. Um, in terms of the UK market, this, this thing called the OJU process, if we leave Brexit, probably is the only good thing to go if we leave, if we leave the European Union. Um, no matter how you try to win a project in Europe, you're not going to win it unless you're very successful in sort of procuring it through other means, which I'm certainly not one. Um, it's usually a, a process for the locals. And should we leave, and please God we don't, there will be issues. Um, professional accreditation, procuring local talent, taxation and tariff, etc. I mean, the list goes on, so you know where I stand. Um, so I have a case study. So of all these places that we've been, I thought we'd just have a look at one, and possibly one of the extreme ones. So this is a project that we're currently doing in, uh, in India for uh, a client called Piramal. And Piramal are a really great client. And I can't say that for every Indian client that I've been in front of, but um, these are fantastic. Uh, they actually do pay. Um, it's, uh, <clears throat> so it's a project for two... 300 meter uh, tall towers in, in Mumbai. Um, and it sits on an extraordinary plot right next to uh, zoological gardens and botanical gardens between the, uh, the uh, Arabian Sea on one side and the port on the other. And the first question was, how, so how do they find us? Well, websites, seriously important. These, uh, no matter what, some, sometimes some of the best clients, that's all they do, they troll websites. And we, we seem to have a reasonably good one. Um, so how did we win the project? And, you know, this is one of those things, you just wonder, well, it must have been the, you know, the great portfolio of work. And, you know, I think it's spun on a word. And that was the word spiritual. And this is what comes down to understanding your client. And they were, they were a very spiritual family. And I said, look, architecture isn't just physical, it's also spiritual. And their eyes warmed up. I just said, what do you mean by that? And then there was a narrative. But I think that's so, so important. So culture and the cultural reference continues in this presentation quite importantly. Um, so a little bit about a project. So first and foremost, the secure ground floor. So I went to Mumbai as an urbanist as well as an architect, thinking, great, let's integrate this into the city. It's going to be really connected, blah, blah, blah. Nah, no chance. Not a, not a chance in hell. Put a wall around it and close it off. It's all about protection. It's all about keeping this place as a piece of quiet repose in amongst the busyness of a city. And you put a great big car park at the bottom, and that's it. And, um, and this is the, the space that we designed, so it's a big drop-off space. Quite smart for the middle classes, of course. Um, and then the public space becomes an internal public space at roof level. So this is where all the joy obviously is experienced with people intermingling with each other at level six or seven in this case. Um, the other difference was this multi-generational living. The apartments are much larger, so you have, uh, you know, perhaps mothers and grandmothers, etc., living in-house. Uh, so we produced a marketing suite for them, which helped enormously, and we're now currently on site um, <clears throat> building the podium. So that's all my architecture. A little bit about learning. India is like a bowl of mixed salad. And this is something they say to us, and I think it's absolutely true. So you have this thing, which is a, you know, but you still have to taste the individual component parts of it. So if you're in Mumbai, it's different than being in Delhi or in Bangalore. It's a, they're different environments. And you have to take that into account. That's too. Those of you that haven't come across it, <clears throat> you need to know a lot about it if you're going to work in India. I mean, it's probably not as, as strong as it used to be, but clearly there is an, a need, a tradition, to look at the way in which spaces are set out according to this me methodology. Um, so the clean spaces are one way, the dirty spaces are another, and the whole thing is set out according to the, the human body. 
Um, I think it's important to understand popular culture and points of reference. Um, so here are three kind of pieces uh, that you might have read or seen as films. I think they are significant because they do highlight elements of what it is that you're going into. You have to reference and understand them. Um, history and culture and Prince business. And I think the one thing that we've really noticed about India is that you've got to calculate for change because nothing is ever fixed. Everything's spinning all the time. You can't, you can't seem to agree on anything. When you think you have, you then start again. It's just so frustrating. So be careful on your fees. Um, it's very hierarchical. Um, business in, in environment, particularly, I think, where you're really only talking to people at your level. Um, and they'll test you out. So we uh, make, we're, a, as you know, an employee-owned trust. So we don't have any names on our, ba on our badges. So our cards, when they come out, just have your name. That's it. So they're, they're all fishing around as to who's the main person. You know, it's kind of struggling. And, and we just, it, it didn't work. Uh, be prepared to haggle. I mean, exactly what Joe was saying, I think. Um, f fees are always going to be a, a complex thing to agree. But dare I say, you need to start from a position where you feel embarrassed to come down to a place where you feel comfortable. <clears throat> um, they might choose you, but you have to absolutely choose them too. Don't go into a situation where you think you've got a project and it's all hunky-dory and you've not checked them out because it's not always uh, as good as it looks on the surface. Um, and equally local architects, I think it is important to find good collaborators because at the end of the day, they know more about the context than you do. Um, you, you can only offer what it is that is unique. Um, don't try and do their job because they'll, they'll completely make you look embarrassed. Um, sustainability is not something that necessarily is high on the agenda, but biophilia, the sense of green space and natural verdant environments is. Um, Working to deliverables, I think you, you will be paid based on what you do. So you have to illustrate and demonstrate that the work that you've promised has been done. Uh, the crack cocaine of Indian developers, FSI. I mean, floor space, this, this is it. This is where it all happens. And in India, this, this is such a, a curiosity. So developers will push hard to maximize this FSI thing. Um, and what they'll do is things like toilets, for example, to get them out of FSI, have to be on the edge and, and have to be naturally ventilated. If you put them on the inside, they're part of FSI and they don't get extra cash for it. So the whole thing ends up being quite a, a hodgepodge of stuff, which is really hard for an architect to organise because you know, in the, we would just put it all in the middle and it's all dead easy. But you end up with a lot of facade, which could look over complex. So you've got to really be able to control it and negotiate your way around these problems. Yeah, what's with the two kitchens business? I mean, this is something that I really found strange is that there's a dirty and a clean kitchen. This is quite important. So you have the, the fashionable middle classes love their clean kitchen in which they demonstrate their cooking ability. But the real action goes off in the dirty kitchen where everyone, their, their sort of, I don't know, their employees do, do their cooking. And it's a real hodgepodge of stuff and it's a real mess and it's kind of a bit... Anyway, they have two kitchens, right? but it's something you have to think about. Um, chasing payments, be robust and clear about payments. It can be painful, absolutely, always will be. Um, and as Joe said, you've just got to keep going for it, otherwise they'll, they'll think you've given up. Um, and long, long days. I mean, they, once you're there, you're theirs. You're, you're bought, you know. You, they own you from beginning to end of the day. So if you can, this is, this is us having a drink at the top of a hotel. Take your time out. And my final slide is the most important slide. This is the most important advice I can give to anybody working in India. You need to know as much as possible about cricket. Lifeblood, soul, culture, the whole thing. I mean, I didn't go after we beat them recently, 4-1. But I'll have to go at some point. Thank you for your time.